Welcome to Level with Emily Reese. Here's music by Jason Graves for the second chapter in the Dark Pictures anthology. It's called Little Hope. Nearly all of the instruments in the score were played by Jason with very little editing involved. So like he left things out of tune and out of tempo and that heightens the fear and also the humanity in the music. Jason worked with the studio Supermassive on their 2015 game Until Dawn, and he also scored the first chapter of the Dark Pictures anthology from Supermassive that was called Man of Medan. Jason starts off talking about Until Dawn. Supermassive did uh, Until Dawn, and it was kind of a breakout hit and put their name on the map. And it was a very deep, long, super, uh, like, head down for five years development process for everybody involved in the game. And um, they loved the whole kind of choose-your-own-adventure aspect of it. And I did, too, because I'm a horrible gamer, so (laughs) I can play games like this and have a lot of fun. I'll play it, you know, it's made to be played with, like, other people, so I'll play it with my youngest daughter. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to continue that heritage, but also uh, they had so many different ideas for different games. So we did uh, Man of Medan together, which was the first chapter of the Dark Pictures anthology. And the idea is it's the same kind of experience as Until Dawn was, except uh, it's it's deeper in the sense that there's more choices and more outcomes and things like that, but it's also shorter. So it's more like instant gratification. And <laughs> you can go back and play again and have a completely different experience. I think Until Dawn was 12 to 15 hours, which is kind of the normal length. And these are more like six hours, as, as mm. far as I know, the, the general playthrough. But they're a lot deeper, like I said. So you make one different decision, and you end up going down a whole other set of choices and experiences in the game, which is super cool. Yeah, and it's not like uh, these um, uh, chapters, as it were, they aren't really related either, right? They're different stories and different experiences altogether, even if the gameplay is similar, right? That's right. So there was Man of Medan, and now there's Little Hope. And they are unrelated in terms of plot and story, setting, the the whole entire thing. They have one single thread that binds them together, and that's the curator, who is sort of the central character that takes you as the player on the voyage. So he's in both of the games. Cool. Yeah. Um, so, and, you know, again, these are scary things. <laughs> These stories are <laughs> frightening. Yes. <laughs> and so, and I mean, you really have such a knack for uh, scary music. Uh, let's talk about some of the instruments that you use in this particular, in Little Hope. And one of the things that I loved was all the dulcimers. So talk to me about, and there are other very like early American, as I think of them, kind of folk uh, music sounds in in this score. So yeah, talk to me yeah. about that. Yeah. You know by now um, how much the sort of the setting of the game influences the instruments that I end up choosing for any score. And this one takes place in a couple of different time settings, but the predominant time setting is kind of the late 1600s in sort of that Salem, Massachusetts kind of area. So I'm sure, just like you, as soon as you say, you know, 1690 Salem, Massachusetts, uh, what are you hearing in terms of music? Just like you said, early American, uh, not a lot of proper tuning, you know, maybe maybe not a lot of proper uh, technique on the instruments, but I, I immediately thought um, bowed psaltery, hammered dulcimer, um, even like some hurdy-gurdy or something, you know, coming over from Europe, uh, frame drums, um, you know, maybe some pianos if they're going to be out of tune, just anything yep. that would just be very uh, antiquated in terms of the instruments, if that makes sense. A 
And I love that you mentioned the piano's out of tune because there's a track uh, called Impenetrable Fog and there are, things are really just slightly out of tune and it, it makes it unsettling and I love that. So uh, tell me about that. That was, <laughs> I, I think I know the track you're talking about because we, we've, we've known each other for so long now, Emily, and, and we talk <laughs> yeah. about so many different things, both on the podcast and off the podcast, that a lot of times when I end up doing those really geeky, like, you know, thinking about uh, piano fortes from the late 1600s or, or whatever, I always think, like, Emily's going to get a real kick out of this. Just yeah. like... <laughs> With uh, with the order, right? When we had no violins in the order, I thought, oh, I can't wait to talk with with Emily about this. But yeah, the, yeah. the piano, um, the tuning in general was a bit of a challenge because I didn't want it to be in tune. The, the whole score is basically wild, which is uh, a technical musical term, meaning it, there's, no, uh, there's no set tempo, there's no specific click. And aside from a couple of sounds that I just couldn't physically record live, 95% of the instruments are all live and it's, it's me playing. So I would start a track just picking up an instrument and playing something for five or six or seven minutes and then picking up another instrument and playing something with that and then just kind of stacking things up. Mm-hmm. And uh, no real set tempo, right? I'm just playing to whatever the first instrument's tempo was. Yeah, I like the idea of, like, just pretend like a bunch of Puritans walked in and these instruments were on the ground and they started experimenting with them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of easy that way to make it sound, like, loose and, and sort of sloppy with the rhythm, but the tuning was always a little bit of a challenge because it's not like it's a string ensemble where you can just say, like, you know, well, half of you play a little flat or something like that. These are the solo instruments. And yep. um, I ended up basically tuning them and then just intentionally detuning everything a little sharp <laughs> a little flat uh the only thing i didn't have to do was the dulcimer because when i got it out of storage it was already like a quarter tone <laughs> flat just i bet nature. it was yeah um yeah yeah exactly and i actually started a lot of songs with that just like dingy 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 just saw a little pulse or something like that and ironically um when I did the the main theme, which I think is just called Little Hope on the soundtrack, my daughter, uh, youngest daughter, Mally, sang on that. And um, I was a little concerned because her pitch is really good. And I was just playing a perfectly in tune piano sample for her so she could hear what to do. And she was just, I mean, nailing it, nailing the pitch. <laughs> and yeah. I couldn't figure out what sounded wrong because everything is a little out of tune, right? But it still sounded like she was sharp. And I couldn't figure out what my ear was referencing. And it turns out it was the dulcimer because the entire dulcimer was almost a quarter step flat, a little more than that. But the but it was in tune with itself, okay. right? So when you're playing, it's like your, your ear drifts to the dulcimer. So I had to go in and basically in the computer, it's the one time I did this, take the whole thing and, and push it up like oh, a quarter funny. tone, a little more than a quarter tone to kind of <laughs> get it in tune. Um, everything else was like completely... Wild, but that that was my one cheat. But I didn't want it to sound like you know she was singing sharp, right? <laughs> That's not fair. Right? It's not her fault. She's doing it right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> No, I really did love that because it also, be, you know, as you said, it's 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 the instruments probably would have been out of tune or a piano or something like that. But also, just amateur musicians tend to play out of tune, and so that exactly. also kind of reminds you of the beginnings of music or the the by which I mean the country wasn't packed full of professional musicians at the time. And so, you know, people don't really care about being in tune and things like that. And, and it's, it's just really cool. It really does bring you to a, a time through sound. Oh, I like that. A time through sound. Yeah. All <laughs> those old 
kind of antiquated string instruments. Um, you know, I didn't have any brass and no wind instruments or anything in this. It was all those string-based things. I either played like cello, viola, or violin, um, or I was doing hurdy-gurdy or bowed psaltery or hammered dulcimer. They're all strings, and I think that really lends the score a certain kind of flavor that you yeah. wouldn't get if you also were saying, well, I'm going to put in some French horns and let's use some synthesizers and yeah. then I'm going to make sure that everything's like, you know, to the grid and all the timing's locked. And I didn't do, um, well, I didn't do anything. It was both the easiest and the hardest thing I've ever done. It was easy in the sense that I didn't use plugins for EQ or compressors, right? Mm, I mm -hmm. literally just did a little bit of EQ or compression with a little box before I recorded into the computer and completed the, uh, used the computer like a tape machine, basically. So there's, nice. I think, like kind of a, a raw, open, sort of hollow kind of sound to mm -hmm, a lot of the score because mm -hmm. none of those instruments really have any low end. Yeah. I've got a drum that's tuned like a big <laughs> dom, dom. So that's got some low end. And I did use some vocals that had some low end in them. Okay. But for the most part, uh, it's sort of a thin, out of tune. You know, I'm not doing it much service. It's like, it's it's not in tune. It's not in time. You know, the EQ isn't that, it's really thin sounding, um, not a whole lot of melody. But you know, that that was the hard part was me thinking the whole time, like, is this is this the right? I feel like this is right for the game, but is it really going to work? You know, on a on a visceral level, uh, yeah. when you pair it up with the the gameplay, and it did. Thank thank goodness, it it worked really well, and we just yeah. kept kind of pushing that sort of idea for the rest of the score. There's also, you know, kind of bell type sounds, particularly in um, uh, something wicked and in witchcraft, and it's it's like um, this intense kind of bowed bass or cello happening in something wicked, and just these kind of bell sounds come back and forth. And I think dulcimer kind of kind of lends itself to that kind of sound as well. So, you know, yeah, just a lot of those high end sounds. I like the idea of the um, like a, a ghostly church bell kind of because there's some yeah. fairly deep religious vibes going on. I mean, let's face it; it's the late 1600s. Everyone's religious, yeah. Um, so I like the idea of. I think you even hear it. Maybe it's one of the first things in the in the main title, the track that's called "Little Hope." There's this. It's a big echoey bell, sonorous kind of round reverberant thing i i don't know mm. bells are always mm -hmm, cool mm -hmm. i think the last time i did that um for tomb raider matt mcconnell had built all this cool stuff and he made some glass bowls so i could i could play those bowls and then of course in um in dead space 2 for the unitology we had like some bells as well but i i try to i, I try to keep those the the like knee-jerk reactions to religious equals bells in my mind yeah. to a minimum. <laughs> yeah. So that's been that's been three times over the course of like ten years. So I, I consider myself safe. And then let's talk about some of these percussive sounds as well, because you it seems like you were doing a lot of like using the backs of bows, which is a specific technique in string playing and, you know, scraping along strings and, and things like that. Did you do stuff like that? Oh, my gosh. So much. Um, <laughs> I've got so I've got a, a, a contrabass, a cello. A viola and two violins, two uh, two separate violins, all from Amazon. And I know we've talked about this before, but you know, not expensive instruments. Thank goodness, yeah. because I 
I abuse them all the time. <laughs> um, but a lot of the like tapping and some some low booming and things like that are just coming from the contrabass. Literally, me just wow. playing it with my fingers yeah. with a microphone next to it. Um, and then definitely some just different, you know, I don't even think these techniques have a name because it's just me playing around, like holding the viola or the cello and experimenting, kind of going from like a solpant, like right at the bridge yep. to, to a more uh, muted tone up on the finger bolt. But I'm also playing like all these horrible notes while I'm doing a tremolo or something. So it's like it's like textures, right? I could not play like a C scale on any of these instruments, but I can get <laughs> close enough to C and yeah. then and then you know like do little creepy things. Um fortunately Little Hope was not a um like a romance score because I wouldn't have been able to do any of this, but since it was scary yeah, that's got me written all over it. Well, and speaking of that, we really haven't said much about the story, and you've alluded to the fact that it kind of goes back and forth between different time periods, the main one being this late 1600s, but also uh, between the present as well. So talk to me a little bit about uh, the story, if you would, and then we can talk a little bit more about the music. I think the general idea is it's the similar kind of horror horror trope, and I mean that in, in a good way, where you've got a, a group of people who uh, get stranded in a town, and there's all kinds of crazy stuff going on in the town. So different people experience different things. Uh, some of them see certain things. Other people see other things. I don't want to give any secrets away. The, the horror games are always fun for the story, that Supermassive does, and I don't want to. I don't want to give too much away, but yes, there's some modern stuff, and um, a little bit of the music focused on present day. But for the most part, I remember having a conversation with Barney Pratt, the audio director, about scoring scenes that weren't taking place in the late 1600s. Of course, the opportunity to do some other music from a different time period within the same game, maybe the same sort of instruments or something, quote-unquote, modernized or brought up to date, sounded really interesting, but it also sounded like a bit of a nightmare in terms of um, implementation, because as soon as you start splitting the music out like that, then you've got to continue sort of the flow to keep the right amount of music, quote-unquote, modern versus the right of amount of music kind of old sounding and and I suggested that we just keep it all old because even if you're in the present day and talking about something and there's a little music cue that plays I thought it was cool that it sounded old and it was sort of hearkening back to the the history of the idea they were talking about or the history of the character that they were discussing or or something like that uh, it, it was a a bit of a cheat but in a way not not really because I think it ended up working well. And that's the sort of thing we would have gone back and revisited it if we needed to. But um, as the scenes kept progressing, I wasn't even really focusing on any of the modern stuff. Barney would just grab what he thought was appropriate. And he's like, yeah, it's, it's working great. So we just, we just left it. And that was, that was a good thing. I do want to ask because uh, when did you start writing this and did did the pandemic factor into any of you making a decision to, to play most of these instruments yourself? How did all of that timing happen? Because that has disrupted a, a lot of plans for composers, but also, uh, of course, it has uh, inevitably resulted in some really beautiful art being made. So talk to me about how that timing yeah. worked out. I know it's it's been really hard for friends of mine who regularly 
you know, fly to London to Abbey Road to record or, yeah. or Skywalker or even Nashville. Um, I've, been, I've been fortunate in that uh, this score, uh, Man of Medan as well, as well as some others that I'm currently working on, have all been intentionally done from my studio and then, if needed, augmented with players who also record themselves in their studios. Okay. It's like I, I kind of fell into that with Moss, um, with Kristen Nagus playing all those woodwinds and Jeff Ball doing violin and viola. Yep. And it was this uh, sort of magical combination because I like the idea of instruments being used the way that they should be used. So if you want a big orchestra sound uh, and you can't afford it, then maybe... Think of something else that you could use besides a big orchestra that will convey the same emotions that you're looking for. And thankfully, with little hope, it was not a big orchestra, right? We wanted that really stripped down, raw, vintage, Mm -hmm. out of tune sort of thing. And um, being a percussionist and guitar player, I'm really good at playing out of tune. (laughs) 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 It's true. Um, I mean, it's like, I think the, the one, the one, disip, the one sort of like, oh my gosh, I need to, I need to work on this. When I first got my hurdy gurdy, cause I ordered it specifically for little hope and, um, they're not easy to come by. And yeah. I think I waited maybe six or seven weeks for this one. Most of the good ones, wow. you have to wait years. It's like a, a three or four year wait list. Oh man. This was a like big be- beginner hurdy gurdy. So I got it out and I'm all excited. And it basically is a box with a circle inside that that grinds against the strings and being the ever experimenter and I can do a little bit of everything on any instrument kind of guy I just got it out of the box immediately and my family's you know sitting in the den and I'm right next to him at the table I get it out and I I kind of get the little dampers off the strings and I turn it and it's just like <laughs> it's just this horrible I mean horrible horrible yeah. noise And everybody, including the dogs, like jump and look over at me and everyone's eyes are huge. And I was like, I'm sorry. I need to, (laughs) obviously I need to tune it or something. And it wasn't tuned. It was intentionally like the strings were not as tight as they were supposed to be. And I was playing it backwards. And, you know, it's just like. (laughs) (laughs) It's amazing. So I didn't use that uh, for, for the score. It's not like Tomb Raider. I ordered a Santour, which is like a Persian dulcimer, and I had an assistant at the time, and he unboxed it for me, and he's like, I haven't touched it here. I, I brought it right, f- right for you to play immediately. And I went, you know, yeah. ding, 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 and it was completely like, dong, dong, ding, dong, ding, ding, like completely yeah. out of tune. He goes, oh, my gosh, I'm so sorry. You know, I'll, I'll have that tuned up. And I was like, no, 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 don't touch it. This is, this is exactly what we need. Um, not so with the hurdy gurdy. It was not what we needed at all. <laughs> mentioned that um, one of your daughters sang, Mally, sang on this score. Was it yes. just on the one track or was she kind of peppered throughout? So she sang on the one track and she did the ooh, ooh sort of vocal yeah. nursery rhymey kind of melody. But at, at the end, I mean, she knocked it out so quickly that uh, I asked if she would just do some, just to, like sing this note for me. And then at the end, just pitch it down a little bit or sing mm. this note and, and, and scoop up towards mm-hmm. the end, just some little quick samples. And then I got yeah. her to do, um, I said, make creepy children sounds. And she was like, I can do that. I'm like, yeah, yeah, do stuff like that. <laughs> that. She did these little samples and literally while she was sitting there, I just cut them up because it was like five phrases. I cut them up and I threw them into contact, which is this program that uh, composers use where I could take her sample of one note, and I could put it across the whole keyboard if I wanted to. So I could play it three octaves higher, six octaves lower. And um, that is where any other 
crazy high, spooky, ghosty sounding vocals that you hear throughout the score. They're all her from these four or five phrases that she sang, because I also reversed them and put them on the keyboard. So Neat. you'll hear stuff like all this bass, all this low end, and it's just her singing, but I've dropped it five octaves and it has this massive weight to it. It's very, very cool. And of course, there's some reverb and stuff to make her feel and sound um, a lot more ghostly. But if you start thinking about listening for a female singing, I think probably 90% of the time she's singing something, just not directly. I'm basically manipulating her in the computer. And did you say there was anyone else that recorded things for you for this particular score? Not not for this one. It was wow. just okay. just little old me and my hurdy gurdy. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> your hurdy gurdy, your two violins, viola, cello, bass, your drum, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, all the things, the bowed psaltery, yeah, all yep. the stuff, some shakers and some, yeah. One of the other things that I love too is. I, my assumption with you, Jason, in particular, is that you, you know, I think everyone understands the concept that you can make a beat with two hands on any kind of surface. But I think that you are <laughs> are so good as a percussionist at, at finding ways to to be percussive with instruments and things like that. So I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about that. I know that you talked about, you know, experimenting with the actual string instruments themselves and that you had a big, deep drum, but I'd love to hear more about just kind of what you fooled around with and and what really ended up working for you. So it's funny that you ask that because being a, a drummer and, and percussionist uh, always felt like a bit of a handicap to me because all my friends played piano or saxophone or cello and they could do all this cool stuff like by themselves, right? Where I would just tap on a desk or like, let me have a drum solo, guys, or (laughs) something like that. But uh, once I got in the studio and got some microphones and could record things, um, I literally recorded my desk for one game, just tapping on the desk and then it had some delay and reverb on it. So a score like this is sort of like a dream come true for me because I can tap, scrape, bow, strum, anything kind of within any sort of rhythmic phrasing that works and then just point a microphone at it. So that's where a lot of the string stuff actually came into play. Um, There's a technique called colenio where the string players, instead of using the bow, like the hair of the bow, they turn their bow around and they use the wood and they tap on their strings. And a lot of times they'll do that very, 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 very lightly because they don't want to use their $70,000 bow and slap (laughs) their... You know, seven hundred thousand dollar cello or whatever. Right. Um, but what I can do is I'll literally just tap the strings with my fingers. So I'll have the cello in front of me the way you would normally have it, and maybe I just did five minutes of you know like crazy sort of effects and stuff, and then I'll just pat you know just like I was tapping this desk, except you're tapping the strings of the cello and the whole instrument yeah. is like got this tick, 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 kind of ticky sound from the strings slapping against the fingerboard. And then the body of the cello, which is where the mic is pointed, is, is resonating. So it sounds kind of like something high, but it's also got this low resonance. And um, I ended up doing that a lot in pencils too. Um, you know, like the ultimate annoying kid in school who's got the pencils and he's pretending to play drum set on his desk. That was me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Except now I actually get paid to take some pencils and, and, and like tap on the viola strings. Maybe they're, they're tuned to an open fifth or something like that. And you can ding, 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 and just get really interesting rhythms that being a drummer seems completely natural to me because I tap on everything all the time anyway. But I think a viola player would be like, I'd never think of playing my viola with pencils and tapping the strings because that's not like the headspace 
that they're yeah. in. So I, I think I've finally come full circle where being a drummer or a percussionist is no longer a handicap. I'm willfully and happily embracing it and kind of finding some original sounds through it, which I love. One of the things that Little Hope enabled me to do when I was working on the score was really go for the live thing. Now, I, and I play as many instruments as I can. Uh, I, you know, I played a lot of instruments on Moss. I played a lot of instruments on Tomb Raider and kind of everything in between. But this was the first time that uh, other than Mally singing and um, a little bit of low end from some strings, the whole entire score is basically me. And mm. I said before, it was the easiest and the hardest. It was easy to do because I didn't do anything. But it was hard because I didn't, I didn't do anything, right? So what my inner voice wants to say is, are you sure you don't want to like, scoot that over a little bit? Or maybe you should you know, delete that and then edit it over here. And I was really firm about treating the computer like a tape machine and just recording things. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they were out of time and they were out of tune. And I think it's kind of important for um, at least composers and, and musicians to um, just consider the fact that you don't have to be perfect all the time in order to, like, put things out there. I would, I would rather listen to, uh, like, a, an imperfect recording of a, of a beautiful performance than a quantized, robotic, perfectly recorded, like computerized orchestra. Yeah. And there's a lot these days that, that are done in the computer. Things get edited. Things get kind of like dehumanized and, and you know, poured bleach all over everything. And it just doesn't, doesn't have that emotion. It doesn't have that sort of chemistry that... I think a live performance really conveys. And of course, I'm trying to do scary stuff. So it's really important to have it feel like natural and, and kind of breathing instead of something in the computer that's kind of stagnant and programmed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that really hit me a lot when I did that score. And I think it's rippled into everything else that I've been doing. I've found since... I finished the soundtrack and then kind of everyone at the game company heard it and it's been released uh, on vinyl. It's going to be released soon uh, digitally and there's been some positive reaction to it. It's like, oh, okay. So it doesn't sound like to everyone else that I just, you know, gave up and just played whatever I thought was going to sound good and just released it. You know, there was a lot of decisions to make it sound that way, but there's also a fear. Like, are people going to think that this is stupid because it's out of tune and out of time and, yeah. you know, all that, all that stuff. But now I'm trying to do that more and more, even if it's not a scary game, to have it be more natural, have it be more live, have it be, um, well, more of my friends playing. I do try to get more live musicians in. Um, some of the ones I'm using currently have never even recorded themselves at home. So oh, wow. um, we're, we're working on like, getting microphones and getting a computer so they can record. And um, it's the kind of thing that we're going to continue doing. And then maybe eventually some live performances as well. It's all about the live, man. Oh, It's yeah. all about the, the humanity. Yep. Don't take out the humanity. Maybe no one's heard the score and they're going to listen to a track and go, that doesn't sound 
like it's out of tune or, or, or out of time or anything like that. But I would argue that even if you're not musically inclined or if you don't have a really good ear like you do, Emily, if it was perfectly in tune and perfectly in time, it would feel different when you heard it. And it would feel different when you were playing the game. And the fact that all those hard lines of tuning and timing have been like really blurred, or, or as my, my cousin used to say when he was little, everything's a little blowy. <laughs> <laughs> right, those hard lines are just a little blowy, and and the pitch is sort of out, and the rhythm's off, and it makes it like sloppy, in a cool way. It makes it, you know, I'm by no means doing any comparison here, but it's more like, like Van Halen or or, or Led Zeppelin um, or, or or Rush, these these bands that were recording back in the '70s and '80s when you couldn't really play to click tracks and they just played live and you can hear it in the recordings there's sloppy entrances the guitar solo is not perfectly in sync but if you go and line it up which i've heard people do on youtube just for kicks it does not feel the same all of a sudden it it's it feels like clinical and all the heart and soul is gone The other thing I, I really loved too is, you know, comparing how the soundtrack for Man of Medan starts, which is the, you know, the first iteration in the uh, Dark Pictures anthology, compared to how right. the prologue starts for Little Hope. I mean, Little Hope starts off like not messing around. It's like, this is going to be scary and there's nothing comfortable about this. And the Man of Badan soundtrack starts off a little more chill and kind of eerie. Yeah. It's nice to be able to have that sort of uh, flexibility and and go from one project to another where I think 10 years ago I wouldn't have really thought this because I was trying to do as much melody as I could. But, you know, there are times for melody and there are times for texture. And you mentioned texture a couple of times. And this was absolutely a texture-based score. There's a little bit of a theme, and it's on the piano and on the dulcimer and the bode psaltery uh, here and there and on the main the main theme, of course. But 95% of the score is texture. And if you saw the game, it's a, it's a very stark, I mean, it's almost black and white, um, the way they uh, have the saturation for the image and the shadows, the, the dark versus the light. Um, and it just seemed like an appropriate thing. And it's nice now because I think after 20 years, I can finally turn that paranoid part of my brain off and say, no, it's cool to do texture. It's cool to do out of tune. It's cool to make something a little different. And it's interesting for me. So it's serving the game, but I'm also doing something fun. And inevitably, 15, 20% of the new stuff that I learn on any project ends up rolling into the next project. And I think of things techniques, instruments, anything that I wouldn't have thought of before if I hadn't done Little Hope, for example. It, it, sure. It's wonderful because it's like the, the creative snowball effect.
as always, thank you so, so much for your time. I love talking to you about your music and I cannot wait to hear what's next. Oh my gosh, Emily, thank you. You know, this is always a highlight for me. Your wonderful ears and musical sensibilities are always in the back of my head when any of these interesting projects are going on. So I'm glad you enjoyed the score and I can't wait to talk about the next one. Thank you for listening to this episode of Level with Emily Reese. You can learn more about Jason and support Level on Patreon. I'm Emily Reese. Sam Keenan is our producer. Say hi, Sam. Hello. You can follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Level with Emily and learn more about us at levelwithemily.com. It's made possible by Adam Selvage at Tiki Web Services and composer Brad Gentle. Level with Emily Reese is a production of June Media, Inc.